Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you all very much for being here. Um, I can usually tell by the proportion of lycra clad to everyday wear. Uh, how, you know, what's, where, where do I need to go with this talk? And uh, clearly, I'm going to talk only to them. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. No, this is, this, is a, this is a talk that I think is in fun, engaging, and entertaining for, for everybody. Um, but let me first say who I am. I'm a, I'm a professor of cultural anthropology at UVM uh, up the road in Burlington. Been there about 20 years after a short stint at the College on the Hill here in Hanover. And then I went to Princeton for graduate school, got my PhD in anthropology. So this is all a way of qualifying by saying I'm not a historian. Um, and so you see those dates. And uh, I'll try and explain how and why I got to that point where I'm actually doing historical research. Um, but my sort of immediate background is I'm an environmental anthropologist. I've been studying environmental social movements in Latin America for the better part of 20 years. I'm a specialist in figuring out what are the, the mo social movements that are arguing for sustainability and what kinds of impacts do they have, what kind of claims do they make, uh, what kind of conflicts are engendered as a result of the work they do. And something happened about six, seven years ago that caught my attention. I'm an everyday bike rider. I'm actually a bike nut. Uh, it's been that way for years. And someone came to me and said, hey, you know what? We have a new institute at UVM. It's a transportation research institute. And have you ever thought of doing research on bicycles? And I said, no. He says, well, we got a lot of federal money to do it. And I said, <laughs> right there. well, the funny, here's my, this may be unexpected reaction. I said, ethnographic research is free. I just ask questions and I listen. I get involved. Why would I need money? You know? <laughs> so, so anyway. The broader question just was nagging at me for a while, and I thought, oh, someone else has probably worked on this. And so I just Googled around. I looked at, I found no cultural anthropologist had written anything of substance about bikes and bicycle culture and bicycle technology. And I thought, aha, here's an interesting opportunity. And so I wrote a book. It's called Reconsidering the Bicycle, an Anthropological Perspective on a New Old Thing. And um, it comes from this point of reference, which is that the bike is enjoying a, a high profile right now in public culture, in urban politics, uh, as an alternative form of sustainable transportation. So in writing this book, I conducted ethnographic research. I was doing it in Bogota, Colombia, riding bikes on the mean streets of Bogota and interviewing activists and a lot of fun, that job. Um, and I was also doing work in Burlington and also in Amsterdam. And I have a chapter in this book where I look at these three cities that are prioritizing bicycles, but are doing it in radically different ways. And so all my field work in Burlington, you know, I'm riding around every day as just getting around, but I'm also morphing into field work mode at intersections. And, I, and I, my, my family and my students think I'm nuts because I'll hang out at intersections just watching. <laughs> and I naively asked the question, what's the history of biking in Burlington? And I thought, oh, for sure, I'll find something. So I started asking around, and nobody has a clue about what's the history of biking in Burlington. And, and uh, you know, a cultural anthropologist, it's, it's a close relationship with history. And so I thought, well, what the heck? You know, I'm dangerous enough in an archive. I might as well just throw myself in and see what happens. Uh, and this just unfolded with an incredible story to tell that no one else was telling. And so that, this has been my avenue for telling the story, is getting in the Speaker's Bureau, writing bits here and there. I've developed a bike history tour of Burlington by bicycle. So if you're ever up in Burlington, let me know, because we can organize a tour of Burlington and see all these sites that were really important places where bicycling was happening in what we now know as, or what actually it was even called back then, the first bicycle boom, or the bicycle boom. The bike craze of the 1880s, 1890s, 19-teens, 1910s. So I started asking questions in these archives. I dive into newspapers, photo collections, maps, city directories, reports of the Department of Public Works, and I'm trying to figure out 
what is the story? Who are these people who are riding bikes in that period when the bike is just taking over as a craze? Um, and uh, what I found is basically in this talk, and as I say, you don't have to be a bike nut. This is a way of, see, for me, as a, I'm a bike nut, right? But it's a lens into talking about social change and, and transformations that are technological, that are political, that have a lot to do with things that you pull a thread over here and it leads you way over here to a totally different issue. Um, and so this is why I love being an anthropologist is you can ask a question over here, why do we ride bikes? And it leads you over here to thinking about women's rights or you know, things like that, which we'll get into. Um, so um, wheeling in Vermont, that's what they called it back in the early years. The word bicycle came into use in the late 1860s, but the question is when and how and why did bikes begin to emerge in Vermont? And the earliest evidence I've found is in, uh, oh, I guess my little pointer doesn't work on the screen, is in 1869 in St. Albans, a velocipede riding school was opened. And uh, velocipede is what it was called. It was um, also known uh, popularly as a bone shaker <laughs> because it was a very, it was a 200 pound thing with wagon wheels and wooden frame that connected them and pedals on the front wheels. And uh, they were quickly banned in places like New York City from Central Park. They were seen as a nuisance. Um, and you rode these things, uh, if not on bone-shaking cobblestone streets, in ice skating rinks. And so this is what St. Albans opened uh, for a couple of years. These things were the craze in the circus world, and, and uh, there were circus acts that traveled all throughout the Northeast uh, with bone shakers doing uh, tricks and so on. Um, and, uh, and so we have bikes as early as that beginning of the bike industry in the United States. Um, by the 1870s, that bone shaker has totally transformed, but it's basically the same concept, that it's a direct drive bicycle, not a geared bicycle, but a direct drive bicycle, and the way they got it going fast was just making that front wheel bigger, and that led to all kinds of uh, really important technical and manufacturing changes, including uh, lightweight steels and bending of steels in certain kinds of ways, and gearing was even starting to emerge at the time. Uh, but here's Frank Gurley from Barrie who was riding. But now mind you, this is in the 1870s and 1880s an elite activity. These things are very, very expensive. They're, uh, you know, well over a month's uh, wage uh, for a, a, a worker to be able to afford one of these things. So they tended to be ridden by elite men uh, who organized themselves into what are known as wheelmen's clubs. Uh, and they rode uh, in very organized fashion. They often uh, wore, wore military-like cavalry clothing, rode in formation. There were ranks and buglers calling out calls. And um, uh, the bike industry was just beginning to emerge in this country in the late 1870s. Uh, and it was a site of real innovation, technical innovation. Um, and uh, even here in Vermont, we had some small-scale bicycle manufacturing in Rutland. Rutland Bicycle Company emerged in the 1880s. Um, <clears throat> uh, but it was still a pretty small activity, even if it was quite a spectacle to see these wheelmen ride through your town. Um, by the 1890s, now we call that the first bicycle boom, the bike had really exploded. The cost of a wheel had really dropped as the manufacturing picked up, as the efficiency of that manufacturing picked up. Um, women started taking to the wheel as the bike industry was creating uh, bicycles just for them. Uh, the, the women's suffrage movement appropriated the bicycle for its own cause, saying it was the, gonna lead to women's emancipation. Um, uh, Wheelmen's clubs popped up all over the place, including here in Windsor, uh, which in the mid-1890s uh, had a wheelman's club of about 40 individuals. And I checked the population at the time, it was about 1,200, or no, 2,000, sorry, about 2,000. So um, these were probably this, the town's gentlemen uh, and clerks and, and professionals, lawyers, doctors, things like that. 
Um, roads began to improve because these people wanted good roads and they took up the cause of promoting good roads. Uh, so, uh, and new ideas about landscape started emerging at the time. Touring was a very popular activity. So that first bicycle boom was really important. Thought that there were four to six million bicycles during the 1890s that, that were being ridden. Here in Rutland, a family posing with their bicycles in 1896, a bicycle party in Bellows Falls, no, it's co-ed. Uh, and then uh, up in Grand Isle, there was a wheel club, we think from Burlington, that took the train up and rode through the uh, Lake Champlain Islands. Um, it was a major source of business activity, not just on that manufacturing end, but on the retail end. And in Burlington in the 1890s, we had 10 shops that were selling bicycles. This is a population of 19,000 at the time. Today we've got 42,000 and we've got four bike shops, right? <laughs> so bikes were everywhere and everybody was getting in on the business of selling them. There was an actual bicycle shop. There was Lane's Bicycle Livery. Uh, he just specialized in bicycles, but you could go to the hardware store and get a bicycle. You could go and get your electrical equipment uh, and visit the bicycle department. Uh, or you could even go get uh, some jewelry. And uh, they, had, they were selling optical goods and bicycles. <laughs> um, and so, and most of these were sort of concentrated right in, if you know Burlington, the Church Street area. But they were spread out into areas now that, that are residential, um, that back then were more sort of workshops. Um, it was by all manner of interpretation, a mania. So this little cartoon from 1897, the latest disease, bicycle mania, we all have it. And for those of you in the back, all of these shop signs are named through sort of bicycle images and so on. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, and some of this is actually quite jocular, but some of it's actually quite serious. Uh, you know, um, bicycle complexion powders, uh, Bicycle face cured. Bicycle face, I don't know how many of you know what bicycle face was, but uh, none of us suffer from it, I can tell, just looking around. Uh, bicycle face was the, the face in a contorted, contorted, contorted mode from the struggle of balancing a bicycle. And it would freeze there. And so uh, that was considered to be an important risk of riding bicycles. Bicycle tonic, bicycle liniment, bicycle food, eat bicycle food, Sprocket Hall. In other words, this is just the tip of an iceberg that was absolutely important, which was people were reimagining their lives through the bicycle. Cities were beginning, there was a small period where cities in the Northeast were beginning to be reimagined and redeveloped as bicycle cities, where the future was one where people were going to get around by bicycle. Uh, and uh, rural areas were imagining a future of connecting towns with bicycle paths. Uh, and a lot of those paths were actually built here in the Northeast and then they've kind of been, uh, they've disappeared. Um, but it was such an important part of life in that period. But here's the interesting thing and why it's relevant to me as a cultural anthropologist studying the contemporary sort of craze of bikes which is that that historical period was one, w w what, it was not just a passing fad. It actually contributed to some very important and durable transformations that we take for granted today. One of the most interesting ones to me is the experience that we all take for granted, we don't even think about it, but that, that experience of effortless speed that we all love and admire and, um, and search for, whether it's in a car, or it's on a bike or something, or a skateboard, whatever. Now, previous to this period, people didn't really truly have that same effortless, autonomous speed that you could get on a bicycle. You had a horse, which got tired, needed to be fed, got lame. That's why they called them iron horses when they, bikes were first uh, out, because they were a horse replacement, right? Um, the other closest you could get to effortless speed was the train. But the train, you were on someone else's schedule. It, the, the way people talked about the train 
was it's a great thing that can take you long distances, but it swallows you up into its system, and you're on its own terms. The bicycle, you, you are in control. And so that experience uh, was really important to people. And that led to an incredible fascination with speed. The 1890s, the big cultural fascination was speed, going fast. And racing was a huge, huge thing. Bicycle racing was the NASCAR of that time. And bicycle racers were nationwide celebrities. Um, it also contributed to, and I think this museum tells part of the story, the transformation of American industrial production towards consumer goods. Right? The bicycle was a very expensive, durable, luxury item. It was really one of the first truly expensive, durable, kind of dispose, like the kind of thing that not everybody needs, right? Um, and so people had to be convinced to buy these things. Part, there was an excitement around it, but marketing for bicycles really was a cutting edge thing. So I noticed just around the corner here, there are some posters with Maxfield Parrish. That he, he got his start making bicycle posters, right? And they, some of the greatest artists of that era were making posters to sell bicycles. And the whole newspaper industry was totally transformed in some senses by bicycles. Up to the bicycle era, you were a subscriber to a newspaper, and that's how newspapers got their income. But the bike industry wanted ads. They said, we want ads, and they helped the newspaper industry shift towards a ad-based mo business model, right? And in the 1890s, probably around 1895, at the peak of that bike boom, about 10% of the content of a typical newspaper was bike-related. So really, really important uh, transformations there. It laid the ground, this is the big story of the bike, it laid a lot of the groundwork for the rise of the automobile, uh, not just in terms of the precision manufacturing involved in that, the creation of ball bearings, the bending of steel, tubing, uh, pneumatic tires, which were invented in the 18, 1888 by an a Irish doctor, John Dunlop, who uh, wanted his, his fragile son not to have to ride on tough roads, and he invented the pneumatic tire. Um, traffic laws, speeding laws were invented. In traffic enforcement in urban areas for bicyclists was created. Uh, repair shops. Henry Ford was the bike repair guy who was part of a big network of bike repair shops. And he understood that those bike repair shops could be easily transformed into automobile repair shops and gas stations and so on. Um, women's relationship with the bicycle was transformative as well. Here's an opportunity for women to be out in public in an unchaperoned way, uh, riding around. And it initially, Women and the bicycle and the transformation associated with women's clothing is what we think of. So the, the bloomer uh, was named after a guy named Bloomer who said, women need to be able to have, be athletic, and so let me create modest clothing for them. There was a, 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 a rational clothing movement in the 1880s and 90s that said, enough with these constrictive clothes for women. And the bicyclist picked up on that and said, yes, we need to change how we dress. Uh, suffragettes picked up on that as well, and Susan B. Anthony and others stood up and said, more bikes, on, or more women on bikes means more freedom for, for women. Um, so a reordering of gender relations, and those were tied with ideas about physical activity. So we have the rise of the notion that you should be physically active. Uh, you know, you're not working on a farm anymore. You're an urban, you know, professional or something, you should be physically active. You have to have recreation and leisure time, and the bike fit right into that. Countryside tourism, touring, before the rise of the automobile as the family vacation, the, the vacation by bicycle into the Green Mountains and to the White Mountains was a really important thing. Uh, so all of these things are transformative of that time, but of course they were controversial as well, right? And so the bike was associated with uh, the religious decay, religious leaders all over the country were declaring that, you know, there was a moral decay that bicycling brought, not just that women were out there riding bikes, but that they weren't going to church on Sundays, they would rather go on a bike ride. Uh, 
And uh, actually, there was a church in Indiana that said, if you can't beat him, join him. So he had ride-in bike services on Sunday mornings. Um, uh, urban propriety norms were just upended as you have these people screaming around towns and scaring horses and pushing people off sidewalks. And uh, there was a real, as you'll see in, as I go through this talk, a real sort of sense of moral crisis around the etiquette of how to get around by bicycle. Um, uh, health authorities, as you saw with bicycle face, health authorities were really concerned about whether, in some cases, the health benefits of biking. In other cases, the, the devastating physical impacts of bicycling. And you'll see that they, from our vantage point today, they seem quite exaggerated, but they were nonetheless a major concern. So in this talk, I, I, I have three sections. We're going to talk about the wheelmen. Who were they? What were they doing? Why did they ha think they had to join clubs to ride bicycles? We'll talk about the new woman. So what's this relationship between women and bicycling at the time? And then we'll talk about good roads. Because roads, obviously, are not just important to bike riding, but they're important to the whole wheelman phenomenon, because they were among the strongest advocates for roads and improving roads. Um, so the wheelman, the Swanton we Bicycle Club of taking uh, their, their club photo in 1893, started bike wheelman's clubs were pervasive. Uh, by the 1890s, but they first started getting, taking shape in the late 1870s. Um, and the first one was founded in Boston in 1878. And the notion was these are wealthy gentlemen. They want to, they were joiners as well, and they want to be with their kind. They want to, you know, enjoy the camaraderie of, of uh, taking on this new hobby um, with others of their type. And um, in Vermont, probably the two of the major locuses in the early years, the, the 1880s, of wheelmen's clubs were in Brattleboro, which had the Vermont Wheel Club, and up in Burlington, where the first wheel club was called the Burlington Wheel Club. That's them on the right. The Vermont Wheel Club was founded actually in 1880 with a different name, the Brattleboro Cycle Club. We think it was the second wheel club founded in the US after the Boston Club. So the proximity to Massachusetts, which is real, really where bike manufacturing, bicycle culture was emerging, means that Brattleboro was a key location for a gateway, I guess you could say, for Vermont bicycles. Um, in the case of the Vermont Wheel Club in Brattleboro, they um, were not just a recreational society. They, this was a place where all the political leaders of the town were members. It was a socially important organization, if not the most important social organization in town. And so if you were an aspiring politician, say here in Windsor, and you wanted to run for governor, you would make sure you made it to their winter ball. Uh, and you slapped hands and so on at that ball. And um, it, was, uh, it produced a number of very influential politicians who ended up taking up the cause of good roads, thanks to their background in wheeling. Um, they built uh, a building, they had a building built for them with incredibly luxurious uh, interior. The building's still there, uh, the interior is not. But part of it was that's where you went and had dinner, or you might have had a, you know, uh, hung out in the, in the early evenings and had a drink. But you also hosted visiting wheelmen. Now, wheelmen were beginning to travel all over the place. And I have a map over here on the right uh, on a tripod that if you, when you get up close after the talk, you can see there are bike paths cutting all the way through, all, the, all through the state, including here in Windsor. And uh, all along the way, if you were a touring wheelman from Boston, you would just call at the that town's wheel club and you would be put up for the night and fed it and welcomed with open arms. Um, in Burlington, uh, what's, what's interesting about Burlington is a lot of these people in the, the image here, I have named a number of them. They were publisher of the Burlington Free Press, important doctors and lawyers. This is in 1886. By 1889, they had abandoned their bicycles and they bought yachts. 
They bought yachts. And so the bicycle was a, not, it was just a tool to show your distinction in Burlington early on. In the case of Brattleboro, you didn't even have to have a bicycle to be in that wheel club. Um, so bicycles were kind of incidental to these things sometimes, right? Bicycles were just a means of showing that you were, you know, an important individual, that you had money, you had means. Um, just down the road here in Bellows Falls, there was a very active uh, wheel club called the Mount Kilburn Wheel Club. Uh, they, they, uh, they were sponsors of comic operas and plays, concerts and balls, known as the social event of the winter. They had ladies' night, um, and they did mock trials, including this ad here for or an invitation in the newspaper, uh, which it was described as, aside from the rare fun of the occasion, the entertainment will be exceedingly interesting to ladies and others who have never attended a real trial. And uh, the, 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 the notion of this trial was that, as it says up there, uh, a, um, a jury of 12 fellow townsmen will def decide uh, as to his guilt. And this, the, the, the story is that somebody stole a Plymouth Rock rooster. And uh, they ha have to try this person. And so it's kind of a mock trial. So you can see that these organizations were well more than just you know, uh, bicycling groups. Uh, closer to where we are now, the Upper Valley uh, was one of the key locuses of wheeling activity and wheelmen's uh, groups. Here's the Woodstock uh, uh, wheelmen in 1889, the Wabino Cycle Club is what, the cl cycle club is what they were called. Um, and in the mid-1890s, there were cycle clubs in Woodstock and Hartford, here in Windsor, uh, White River Junction, Lebanon, Claremont, across the, the way was very full, full of wheelmen. And Bellows Falls was full of wheelmen as well. Uh, and parading was an important thing. Wheelmen loved a parade. Uh, if it wasn't an official July 4th parade, they would make a reason to have a parade. And they would um, ride through towns with a lot of pomp. Uh, Burlington was a very popular destination for parading wheelmen because it had sandpapered streets. Uh, it was known for its great streets for parading. Um, and this uh, little article on the right describes a bicycle parade that took place in Woodstock in 1895. 200 wheelmen showed up from fell, uh, surrounding towns. The town was lit up with 3,000 Japanese lanterns. Um, and it was quite a spectacle. Uh, and the wheelmen were sort of the, 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 at the heart of this uh, 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 event. And a parade could draw, one article I read, found somewhere uh, described a 500 wheel parade in Woodstock. I mean, can you imagine? So uh, people coming from all over the little villages around here to go, to, to, and they were often taking the train. They'd hop on the train up to Woodstock with their wheels, and there was a, in Bellows Falls, uh, they, the wheelmen community organized to uh, take on the, the railway company to allow them to bring their bikes on for free, as opposed to charging them. Um, Woodstock plays a conspicuous role in other respects in bike history. Um, this is an image that uh, I ran across. Uh, and it, this is the house of James Murdoch. He was a merchant um, in uh, Woodstock, taken around 1900. Um, and as you look closely, you take note of that, which is uh, an exotic looking bicycle which has some interesting ties to Woodstock. So it just happens that this individual in Woodstock had one of these. This is known as a star uh, rider. The star rider was the best bike going between 1880 and 1884. <laughs> and it was this transitional bike between that big high wheeler, which was a very dangerous bike, the term header, is the term they came up with to describe what happens when you roll over. So this reverses it. This is a small wheel in front, big wheel in the back. And you can maybe notice that this are, these are not, this is not a crank pedal system. This is one of those almost like an exercise machine. You would just sort of step up and down. You could also lock them in place and go like this. And these things were fast. They, they created all kinds of races with these things. And they were very stable. And so uh, John Stout, who was kind of the, um, the um, uh, Tiger Woods of his era, 
He was a deaf mute. Uh, here he is riding a star rider down the Michigan State Capitol steps, showing how stable the bicycle is. Um, a guy named Hazlitt rode a star rider down from the top of Mount Washington in 1884, and he survived to tell the story. <laughs> The Star Bicycle, the reason it's connected, well, and by the way, they have a song, there, and you can get the music. I, I wish I was a musician, because I would, you can just Google it, and it's like, oh, you download the music and play it. Um, the Star Bicycle, clearly the best bike of its brief era. Um, but it, this, the connection to Woodstock is interesting. So uh, there was a guy from Woodstock named H.B. Smith, and H.B. Smith um, was in the, the world that we're in right now. He was a precision machine manufacturer. He made precision wood machine, uh, machine well, wood processing machines. Um, and he, he left Vermont because he, he, he felt like New Jersey was where the future was. And he, crea he, he, he created a town called Smithville in New Jersey. And in Smithville, um, the inventor of the Star Rider happened in one day and said, I'm looking for someone to manufacture this idea. And so Smith was like, I'll do it. And so Smith was the guy who you know, created these things. And um, so, uh, so that's Woodstock's connection to a craze for a short period. <clears throat> the other thing bicycle, or let's say wheelman's clubs did was they, they concerned themselves a lot with the propriety of riding. And so you know, riding uh, was brand new and it was disruptive and it was thought that riding in groups that were organized uh, made them more predictable, made them more visible, uh, made them more organized so that they weren't disrupting too much. Um, and the newspapers of the time take on the question a lot about, well, how are we supposed to act around these things? How are we supposed to act with these things? So this is a little column called Bicycling or Sage Words for Cyclists. Always keep to the right. Always keep your wheel clean. In passing another rider or vehicle, keep to the right. Keep off crowded streets unless you have urgent business there. Don't forget that pedestrians have rights. It often saves bitter thoughts. <laughs> that was in 1895. And then this was from the United Opinion in Bradford in 1895 as well. This is, it's called Cycling Etiquette. Uh, and I'm just going to read the whole thing because it's fascinating. Every sport has its rules of etiquette and a system of exchange of courtesies must be adapted to cycling conditions. A question that is causing a great deal of agitation relates to the mode of greeting among wheelmen and wheelwomen. Shall a man take his hand from the handlebar at the risk of taking a header in order to tip his cap? Or shall he merely nod his head and say, howdy? Shall a lady make a swooping courtesy or merely nod? Instances are cited wherein men have tried to do that which they have been taught from childhood, and the result has been a hectic flush all over one side of their faces, where the skin was caressed by the loving but somewhat calloused hand of Mother Earth. <laughs> Ladies who have been picked up tenderly by tending hands after it was all over. It is with reason, therefore, that cyclists are giving this matter serious consideration. So they had to invent new norms of social interaction and public uh, politeness and so on. The other thing that wheel clubs did was they organized races. Uh, racing, as I said, was a very important kind of cultural phenomenon of the period. And the Mount Kilburn Wheel Club uh, here uh, in 1897 organized a race uh, from Bellows Falls to, um, to Claremont, New Hampshire. And I love how this article describes it. It says, a good share of the village showed up accidentally <laughs> to watch it. <laughs> um, so this was a 40 mile, about a 40 mile ride. Um, and uh, the winner came back in two hours and nine minutes, which averages out to about 20 miles per hour. So put yourself uh, in that period when the roads are terrible shape. Uh, the um, technology here is not especially uh, advanced when it comes to gearing. They, I, these could have even been single speeds, although gears did exist. Um, and then, as this story at the bottom describes, lots of mishaps happened along the way for, to all the riders. Uh, and this describes, it says, um, when at the top of Dean Hill, about five miles this side of Claremont, on the return trip, 
Henry, Henry Grignon broke the rim to one of his wheels and rode two miles farther before meeting his cousin with whom he exchanged wheels. He then rode to Charlestown where he secured another mount and arrived third in the race in spite of the mishap. This image here is from uh, some races that took place at Billings Park in White River Junction, which was an important and popular destination for, to watch bike races uh, during the 1890s. The other thing is that wheelmen were engaged in all kinds of feats of endurance. And this little article from the Herald and News in West Rand Randolph describes a trip that two, uh, as, uh, uh, two, as he describes them, two crack Woodstock wheelmen Irving Ransom and Max Mass rode uh, uh, an incredible trip. So they started at 2.30 a.m. Uh, they headed 83 miles to Littleton, New Hampshire. Um, they got to Littleton, took a short rest, and they said, let's keep going, and we're going on to Woodsville. Um, by the end of the day, 20, 23 hours, they had covered 158 miles. Uh, and then they spent the night up in St. Johnsbury and uh, rode home. Uh, another 52 miles, and um, maybe it wasn't St. Johnsbury. Um, uh, in any case, these are incredible feats of endurance, and this is nothing new for wheelmen. The, ver the first um, trip, bicycle trip around the world was between 1884 and 1885, and it was taken by a guy named Stevens, who was a British guy, on a high wheeler. He rode around the world on a high wheeler. Uh, by the early 1890s, riding around the world on bicycles was no longer considered uh, that special a thing, although it was still special enough that if you tried to do it, you were often a correspondent for a local sporting newspaper, and they paid for your trip. <clears throat> but scorching was a real problem, and scorching is the sort of the wheelman's opposite, the scorcher. There was a great moral crusade that was against scorching, and scorching was this sort of individual, typically a young male, often working class, who was not a member of a wheel club, who was zipping through town. You know, in Burlington, you know, it's the college freshmen, right? They're zipping down for Pearl Street, and, you know, and, and actually there are reports from 1899 and 1898 of, you know, yet another UVM freshman crashed down Pearl Street on his bicycle. It still happens today. Um, but the scorcher was this sort of scourge of urban life, and it was, you know, these young men zipping around, and this is a a story that uh, appeared in the Free Press in Burlington in 1899. Um, and so I just love the opening. Another accident occurred Tuesday evening as a direct result of the ever-present bicycle scorcher. Uh, and it describes how this, this uh, it was actually a mechanic at that bike shop, which is on Loomis Street. Uh, a mechanic was riding down the street scorching, and he hit poor nine-year-old Barney Buxton. Um, and uh, Barney was laying there unconscious, with a cut gash on the side of his head, his right arm seriously bruised, and they called Dr. Lyman, who came over, and as the boy, uh, as they say, as the, the, la the lad regained consciousness but was not able to remember anything about the accident. So these stories of scorching are all over the newspapers of this period, uh, and uh, uh, there's an interesting class dimension to this, right? Uh, a lot of these scorchers were really working class young men who didn't fit into that socio-economic structure that prioritized bicycles. Yet they wanted to bicycle to, as well. And so in response to, to the scorching phenomenon, wheelmen thought, let's take matters into our own hands. Let's propose regulation on our own terms. Right? So this is from the Bellows Falls Times, uh, 1897. There has been considerable complaint of fast and reckless riding. It is better that the wheelmen take the matter in hand themselves. We suggest all wheelmen carry lanterns and bells and keep to the right side of the street uh, or on such bicycle paths as hereafter may be provided. And so 1896, 1897, 1898, almost all towns in Vermont adopt ordinances controlling bikes. And that's the beginning of traffic regulation in Vermont. Uh, speed limits, bell requirement, lighting requirements, uh, no riding on sidewalks, things like that. You know, it's, we're still struggling with the same issues today. Um, the thing that intrigues me about this 
is that last little bit or such bicycle paths as may hereafter be provided. And between 1896 and 1899 or so, there was an incredible spate of bicycle path building uh, in New England and into the Midwest. And what it was was this vision that the future is a bicycle future. And so they started building toll roads between villages. And the idea was that you, you bought a little medallion that you put on your bicycle that so shows you paid your toll. If you didn't, there was a toll gate to often at the beginning of and the end of each of these sections. And different wheelmen's clubs for individual towns organized all this. And, got the bank to lend them money to build these things and hired the workers and so on. Um, and the vision was just all rural America connected by bicycle paths. And the, as I said earlier, they got built in many cases. Thousands of miles got built and then they just sort of, you know, disappeared um, as the car took over. Other legal matters, of course, were emerging. Bicycle thieves were everywhere. This is a story here, played out here in Windsor County in the courts. Uh, George Ash was a bicycle thief and he, he stole a bicycle in White River Junction and tried to sell it up in Chittenden County. He claimed it was given to him by a college student. Now I hear that story all the time. Oh yeah, it's like, <laughs> college student gave it to me. You know? And why does it look stolen? You know, so, but uh, what's interesting about this is that the value of the bicycle, in, in, this is in uh, 1899, was set at $7. In today's dollars, that's about $190. But George was in jail for three months because of this. So it says something about the, the kind of comparative value that they placed on that object, which was you know, a very prestigious, cons expensive consumer good. So you, know, you, were, you were in big trouble if you stole bicycles if you, and were caught. Now, the new woman. Um, these are the Wells ladies. 1896, General William Wells, you know him perhaps as one of the heroes of Gettysburg, lived in Burlington. His family uh, created, got tremendously wealthy. Uh, they created Payne's Celery Compound. Anyone ever heard of that? Payne's Celery Compound is one of these great Edwardian, Victorian era snake oil things that, you know, it, it, it says it'll cure insomnia, heart attacks, liver disease. Uh, you know, broken legs. I mean, you, you name it. And, and actually, uh, pay, like the company, it was called the Wells Richardson Corporation, um, they paid a cyclist, a, a prominent cyclist, to promote pain celery uh, compound. So anyway, the Wells, these women, were very elite women, and they were some of the earliest women adopters of bicycles in Burlington, um, and uh, uh, were, were known to parade about themselves. Um, but the woman and the wheel was an important theme in public discourse at the time. This is a little snippet from the Burlington Free Press. The coming woman will be the woman whose mother rode a bicycle and thereby made herself fit to be the mother of the coming woman. <laughs> there are eight million bachelors in the United States. Watch the re reduction in number as soon as the bicycle girl in bloomers is scattered over the land. Lots of new etiquette questions came up around this as well. This is selecting a cycle teacher. Uh, most cycle depots will send up a man to teach any of their own customers, and many ladies have learned their, in this fashion. Personally, however, it seems to me that if one must clutch any male thing wildly around the neck and fall into his arms 10 or 20 times in the course of an afternoon, a relative or intimate friend is better than an unknown oily mechanic. <laughs> And I should therefore counsel any girl who contemplates learning the safety to select her teacher with these unavoidable contingencies in full view. So people getting into each other's space in new and uncomfortable and disruptive ways. And that was being negotiated around gender relations, very much so. So a lot of the interest around women taking to the wheel was framed through the creation of a new kind of body for women, a body that was less restrained and constricted by the clothing of the time, 
uh, and more able to exercise, to exercise, to build fitness, to build uh, a sort of stamina. And, um, uh, and so the, the, the first meeting here in Vermont in 1892, there was a sort of the statewide suffrage uh, convention. Uh, what, uh, it's the rights of suffrage and the complete enfranchisement of women. You open it up and the first section of it is physical training for women. So it wasn't we demand the right to vote. It was we demand the right to have access to physical fitness, right? And so the bicycle was seen as the natural vehicle for this. So it's one of the reasons why you see a close association between the suffrage movement and the bicycle. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote glowingly about the bicycle and she felt like it was going to be the, the means through which women got control over their own bodies and could publicly display their importance to the, the broader society. There was a backlash. Um, there was quite a backlash coming from uh, the, uh, the temperance movement. Uh, women who saw, who were upholding the moral fiber of our society uh, through temperance also saw the bicycle as challenging that the, 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 the way women were upholding that moral fiber. Um, so it was not in, uncontroversial. However, the bike industry did respond very quickly and the bike industry uh, sold all kinds of products just for women. So there's some ads there for not just ladies' bicycles, but ladies' gloves, ladies' mittens, skirts, bicycle skirts, bicycle shoes. There was a whole burgeoning uh, um, d uh, display at any bike shop of women's accessories um, at the time. But there was a lot of ambivalence, especially here in Vermont, about uh, women's suffrage. And in fact, Vermont never on its own passed uh, uh, the rights of women's suffrage. Um, and this was just a little snippet from the Orleans County Monitor in 1895. Miss May June, do you believe in women's suffrage? Miss Janfeb, well, er, I haven't quite come to that yet, but I ride a bicycle. Right, so there was a delinking in some cases here in, in Vermont where the bicycle wasn't always symbolically associated with, with uh, suffrage. Um, some arguments about why Vermont never passed it. Um, women had uh, the right to divorce here already. Uh, women had a fair amount of economic autonomy. The emergence of the tourism industry meant that more and more women were in charge of handling the visitors who were coming in and handling the money that they brought. So when they're staying at a farm, they're cooking for them, they're being paid by their visitors. Um, women tended to have more education here. So it all somewhat related to uh, the lack of a very strong suffrage movement as you found elsewhere. Um, but a lot of where the concerns around women and women's bodies was playing out was around the health consequences of bicycling. And so um, as you know, one side of that debate was this is the best RX is to go on a ride, take it instead of going to the druggist. Or as an 1895 article in the Free Press in Burlington said, um, it was called Bicycling Hygiene. It said, um, you know, you should go bicycle because it opens up your pores which should be treated with ablutions of water. Uh, you should know how to breathe. Breathing through the mouth can cause heart troubles. <laughs> uh, and be sure your mouth doesn't get parched. It can affect your digestion. Drink milk with a few drops of rum in it before a ride. <laughs> <laughs> and then the reaction to that was the denouncement of bicycle riding. And this is such a remarkable little article it describes the remarks of Dr. Heine Marx, who was the ex-superintendent of uh, the city <coughs> hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, he, his, his opening gambit here is, to my mind, owing to the excess of exercise indulged in by bicyclers of today, when a man or woman buys a wheel, they take the first spadeful of earth from their graves. <laughs> so he describes what happens if you ride bikes. He says, first you have a kind of paralysis of the hands and a contraction of the chest. This causes congestion of the lungs and leads to consumption. Isn't that tuberculosis? <laughs> Furthermore, with men, rupture of hydrosyly follow, and worst of all, it destroys virility. 
With women, riding promotes amorous desires. <laughs> women are especially liable, married women are especially liable to very serious mishaps. <laughs> and then he concludes, if the world is not depopulated by the rapidly increasing membership of this suicide club, the human race will die out by reason of lack of manhood and inability to propagate. <laughs> and that's in the Burlington Free Press in 1895. So these debates played out in our newspapers. And, uh, uh, you know, people would re react to this. The next week you'd see a bunch of letters from the editors denouncing Dr. Heine Marx on some, one side and the other saying, he's right, you know, we got to uh, stop this. Recently, <clears throat> many doctors have said that prolonged bicycle riding affects the libido. Yes, I've heard so this, that's yeah. True. I've heard <laughs> this, yeah. Now what about the roads? So the roads were a mess. In 1894, that image on the right uh, appears in a report of the, Vermont Hi the newly constituted Vermont Highway uh, Commission. Uh, and uh, so roads were up to the, the, this era. The roads were, yeah, they were terrible. And the reason they were terrible is that uh, you as the landowner who was proximal to a road were responsible for building and maintaining it, unless it was a toll road. And there were toll roads in Vermont. Those are our first roads. Um, but they were, they were relatively few and far between. Um, so most Green Mountain roads were uh, abysmal because, you know, who has time to deal with this stuff when you're trying to make a living as an agriculturalist? Yet agriculturalists here knew that their survival depended on good roads. But it was the wheelman who really took up the cause of good roads. And um, what's uh, interesting about that is that in 1880, the League of American Wheelmen, which was a national organization, was founded in Providence, Rhode Island. And at the same time it was founded, they created the League of Good Roads. They were seen as sister organizations. And the League of Good Roads was the political arm of the League of American Wheelmen, which was going and putting itself in place to lobby the government to take over responsibility for building and maintaining roads. Right? Um, so before that, how did you deal with this? So this is a remarkable little book published in 1887. It's actually not a little book. It's a huge book. It's called 10,000 Miles on a Bicycle. It's by Carl Crone. His real name was Lyman Bagg. Um, and he took a bike ride all around the Northeast into the upper Midwest, 10,000 miles worth. And every time he'd stop in a town, he would consult the wheelmen. He'd say, what are the good rides? And would you like to give me $5? So, and I'll send you in exchange my guidebook that I create and when it's done. And so the, much of the book is taken up with all the subscribers. And so if you want a sense of, <laughs> Who was a wheelman in 1884, 85, 86? In any town that he passed through, they're listed there for the most part. Um, and so this describes, he has different sections where he describes a ride in Vermont. Um, and this is his little jaunt through this area. The longer, the, so he, he rides, uh, um, he, he, he prefaces this all by saying, the longest day's ride previously taken in Vermont was on July 9th, 1883 by two Rutland boys, W. w Eggleston and N. S. Marshall, 100 and a half miles. Vermont's first century, <laughs> taken in 1883. Um, I have ridden from Bellows Falls to Montpelier and Burlington and call the roads as a whole fair. From Bellows Falls to Windsor, 25 miles, I took the New Hampshire side of the Con Connecticut River and found some patches of sand, thence to White River Junction, 15 miles, some fine stretches, some unrideable, thence to Royalton, 20 miles. So you got a sense by using a book like this of, you know, where, where can I ride, right? The other thing you would do is you would buy a map like that. And so um, one of the tasks of, that wheelmen put themselves to was mapping the countryside and mapping the roads and mapping the good roads. And the League of American Wheelmen published riding, riding guides, which you can still get on eBay, actually. And you can still get maps like this on eBay and so on. But before all that, you had Carl Crone out there doing it and getting it going. Um, the Good Roads vision was 
very much financially uh, developed and supported, or sorry, developed and financially supported by the bicycle industry. So Colonel Albert Pope, uh, he was a um, uh, Boston uh, brevet colonel during the Civil War. In 1876, he went to the Philadelphia Exposition, World Exposition and he encountered one of those high wheelers. And he said, ah, I have a vision. And so he bought one of them and then he went to a sewing machine factory. You'll notice in the, in the exhibit here, there's a close association between precision manufacturing that makes sewing machines and bicycles and so on. He takes it to a sewing machine factory in Hartford, Connecticut, and he says, can you make this? And they make it. And he says, I want thousands more. And then he buys the sewing machine factory. And he, so by the mid-1880s, he's very wealthy. And uh, he says, we need good roads. And so he puts a lot of his money and his prestige into the good road fight. And he says, the, an eminent writer says, the road is that physical sign or symbol by which you will best understand any age or people. If they have no roads, they are savages. For the road is the creation of man and the type of civilized society. So he, he sponsored a little competition um, in uh, the early 1890s. 100 Columbia, Bi he created Columbia Bicycle Company. Uh, 100 Columbia Bicycles given away. He sent this to college students and high school students. He says, write an essay about the importance of good roads. And if we choose your essay, you get a free bicycle from us. Ro Wheelmen went on protest rides. You know, we think we might have invented that recently. They, they invented it back then. This was a ride to Osable Chasm, probably from Plattsburgh. Um, uh, and there's the Good Roads Frog there on the right. He's got a statement about the importance of good roads. And so they were trying to draw attention to themselves uh, on big organized rides. The wheelmen were so critical to the good roads movement. The road movement is growing and gaining in favor and popularity. And there's no organization that has done so much as a body to promote it as the wheelmen. A hard and smooth road surface to them is what air is to a bird or water to a ship. And yet it is no more essential to the cyclist than to the agriculturalist. The only difference being that the former supplies his own power and hence knows its value, while the latter simply holds the reins and whip which propel and control his animal motor. So wheelmen were putting their money and their prestige and their political capital into the fight for good roads. And Vermont was the first state in the country to pass good roads legislation in 1892. The governor at the time was Levi Fuller, whose father-in-law was an officer of the Vermont Wheel Club. <laughs> so, yeah, funny thing, exactly. And uh, so what does this Vermont Highway Act do? Something that we take for granted today. It begins taking centralized control over roads uh, by the state and the municipalities. Uh, it charges people a new property tax that is going to be paid to the state but distributed back to the towns so that the towns can fix their roads. And towns are authorized for the first time to issue bonds uh, to fund good roads. And it establishes a state highway commission. So these are all things we take for granted today. Good roads conventions happened all over the state. There was one that took place here in Windsor uh, in 1906. And I love how it describes it, um, the, 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 good, the Windsor County uh, Good Roads Convention. The attendance was not large, but this is not to be or, but this was to be expected Hearing about good roads is not like attending a ball game. <laughs> but good roads form a valuable asset to every community. To have good roads stamps a region as at, at once as civilized and attractive. So it, there's this whole discourse around civilization and good roads that the wheelmen promoted. Uh, and that one thing I remember that Albert Pope said in an address he gave was that the Incas, those savages, even had better roads than us, <laughs> right? So there was a sort of sense of cultural superiority, but at the same time, a sense that we are inferior even to people like that. By 1900, uh, the bike is beginning to have to make way for a new vehicle, and that's the automobile. Um, the first car to climb Mount Washington uh, was in 1899. Uh, the Vermont Motor Company was established in 1902. Horatio Nelson Jackson, who was the, the son-in-law of William Wells, made his famous bet that he could drive a car across country in 1903. He succeeded. He went from San Francisco to New York. 
the Burlington Automobile Club, you know, it's the yacht people are now in getting automobiles, right? And then the Gentlemen's Driving Club founded in 1910. The Vermont Phoenix in 1902, so the Phoenix is a Brattleboro paper, describes a Burlington's, you know, so wheelmen traveled. They would love to go to parades in other places. So they'll travel from southern Vermont to Burlington for a parade, for the 4th of July parade. They had, uh, you know, um, automobiles, bicycles, bicycle brigade, horribles. You all know what horribles are? No. Horribles are a wonderful kind of Vermont thing. They're, um, it, they're um, satires on important political figures. And so they would dress up like politicians and make fun of them and <laughs> exaggerate them. Sort of like ritualized clowning, and if I put it in cultural anthropology terms. Um, and then what happens is the newspapers stop talking about the excitement of the bicycle. They stop talking about the wheelmen's clubs. They stop talking about women on bicycles. And they start talking about this, bicycle and automobile conflict. These are all articles uh, from... 1914 on. One here right in the middle is actually here in Windsor. William Conlin, about 10 years old, was knocked down yesterday afternoon by an automobile driven by Remy Fecto and suffered a dislocated shoulder and bruises. The boy was riding a bicycle. So that, that notion of bike <coughs> automobile conflict was born very, very early. And mind you, automobiles were not that common in Vermont at this time. They were still, you know, a couple of hundred automobiles at the most part. You know, we don't have a real automobile explosion until after World War II, maybe 1930s, you start seeing automobiles emerging in Vermont. The war sort of stops all that. But killings, conflicts, collisions, and so on. That's when the bike leaves the road. It's no longer a transportation thing. It's no longer a recreation thing. It's a kid's thing, right? And then the bike industry responds. And for the better part of the 20th century, the bike produ industry produces kids' bikes. And that's the story. If you've got an old box of photos in your attic, I love old bicycle photos. And so let me know. My email's there. And I'm happy to answer any questions or field any comments or, you know, yeah. My question deals with the tires in the early days. Can you comment on the quality of the rubber tires in the early days or lack like thereof? <laughs> yeah. They, the quality of rubber tires was not so great, and they were not easy to put on and take off. Or they would snap, right? Um, the, the real quality of rubber increases in the late 1890s. You know, these early tires were not the most reliable tires. They were popping a lot. They're, one of the reasons that bike repair shops were, were popping up even in small towns was that traveling people with, with wheels needed to get their tires repaired. So the, 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 the excitement of the pneumatic tire was kind of offset sometimes by the fact that these things were not super great. They were popping a lot. So you needed to, you know, old bikes have incredible amounts of repairs if you see the old tires. Um, they were mostly tubeless in many cases. They were, you know, so they were glued on. Um, there weren't inner tubes for a while. Yeah. I didn't hear you make much of the transition between the ordinary and the safety. I've always felt that there was a huge yeah. difference. Yep, it's a big, you yeah. You can give a little top high wheels away when the safety came in, and that's how the, way, the lady program started participating. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's an important point to raise. I mean, it, it's transformative, right? That technological shift. And the first safeties uh, are created in 1885. Right, the first, I should say, popularly accessible safeties are 1885. That didn't mean, though, that the high wheelers disappeared, which is fascinating. And the question is why? Why did the high wheelers stick around for at least another decade? Any theories? Ego. Inertia. And, iner okay. Ego, inertia, any others? Racing. Racing, yeah, they were still a lot faster. Any others? There was an interesting cultural dynamic at work here around sportiness. The high wheeler was really hard to master. Really, really hard to master. And you showed your amount of physical prowess by riding a high wheeler, not a safety. Did you ask how many here have ridden the high wheeler? <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah, exactly. I mean, so this plays into tricycles as well, because tricycles were in the story as well. Tricycles 
were uh, not as common, but tricycles were the ultimate solution to the dangers of the high wheeler. But, and in fact, the royal family in Britain, the royal family in the Netherlands, they all loved tricycles, and so they were prestigious. Um, but it wasn't seen as sporty. It was like, oh, that's kind of lame. <laughs> you know, and we, we inherit some of that, right? The tricycle is, you know, the best bikes out there for speed, for ability to compete with traffic, for wind efficiency, all that stuff, they're the tricycles. They're, the, they're basically the velomobiles. I don't know if anyone has ever ridden one of those, but they're fast and they're efficient. But we kind of look down on them because they're not really that sporty, right? So that high wheeler was kept around because it was a way of showing your physical prowess and your distinction and so on. Eventually though, you know, what the safety did was totally transformative and it meant that everyday people could get access, right? And so, you know, the, the designs we have today are pretty similar in some senses, but that doesn't mean it was stagnant. I mean, bicycle technology has changed and evolved over time. And one of the interesting things I didn't touch on as well is that Pope, for example, with the Columbia Bicycle uh, Manufacturing Company, by 1893-94, he's already envisioning a future of him making automobiles. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't know exactly what they're going to look like, but he's already got a section of his factory tinkering, putting motors on things. And there was um, a lot of movement from bicycle industry into the automobile industry. And just one of the other tidbits of this that's really fascinating to me is Henry Ford was on a trip uh, to the Pope factory when he was a bike mechanic uh, to experience, uh, it was sort of like, you know, manufacturers do this, right? They bring in people to show, show the process and so on. And Henry Ford was blown away by two things the assembly line production, and the electrification. Thomas Edison had been paid to electrify that factory in Hartford so it could work 24-7, going constantly. That was the scale of it. And Henry Ford went out of there clearly with some big ideas, <laughs> right? And so a lot of that energy, technology, and so on just shifted right into the automobile. Yeah. Uh, Eddie talks about the, the introduction of Glenn Curtis and putting a Sears motor on top. Yeah, this is this was uh, the, you know as early as the 1880s, people were putting motors, internal combustion motors, on these things. Late 1880s, and they were often pacing vehicles for racing, right? So you either had tandems. There was one that was a six-person tandem. There was a that was actually a pacing bike, or you had these little motorcycle type things. And so yeah, motors were being added to bicycles from the very earliest moments. Yeah. Most everything you talked about is individual and social and everything. Was there a commercial or a business side to this bicycle? Huge, huge, absolutely. Um, th it was a side of prestige, right? Because this is where the technological cutting edge was. Uh, it's a side of innovation in business practice. I'll give one example. Pope, again, we keep coming back to Pope. Pope was all about patents. Obviously, the right to patent things existed, but he patented everything. And he had a whole legal department that went after anybody that was infringing on his patents. And Vermont plays a unique little story in that. So when he was looking to build the, um, his new factory for, to build Columbia bicycles, there was a patent that was held by the Montpelier Manufacturing Company for a certain aspect of the high wheeler. And he had to send one of his agents to Montpelier to convince them to give it up. And they did. They sold it to him for a small pittance. And that sealed the deal for him. He could now have access to this. And that patent, this is, you know, it connects directly to bike history. So I have to back up just a minute. So the very first, we don't even call them bicycles, but velocipedes were in the 18 teens. And they were called Velocipedes or lauf machine, running machines. And they were created by a guy named Carl von Dres. And that was the year without summer that he did this, 1816. And d horses were dying. And he said, we need a replacement for the horse. And so he creates this thing that looks like a, it's just a piece of wood and some wheels and not very good steering. And you would run with it. 
They were called dandy chargers because dandies took to them. But, they, but this is in the 1820s, 1830s. By the 1860s, it was dead. Nobody was interested in these things. But in a Paris shop, uh, someone shows up with one of these things and it was broken. And one of the mechanics there, a guy by the name of Pierre Lalamont, he said, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna mess around with this. And he adds some cranks and pedals to that front wheel. That's the first bone shaker. And La Lamont says, screw Paris, I'm moving to the US. I'm gonna make a million. So he goes to Connecticut and he, he, um, he basically patents this design. And that design changed, he, he went back in failure. He, a few years later, he had not made it. But that technology and that patent still exists and it changed hands. And eventually ended up here in Montpelier. And Pope had to come up here to get it. And that was, uh, so patenting, was a huge thing that the bike industry did and really aggressively uh, went after infringement. Being the bicycle manufacturers, I meant the local businesses and yeah. other people other than the manufacturers of bicycles. Did it have an impact on business? Yeah, so it did. Um, <coughs> it, it, it impacted, it, it, first of all, it created opportunity. I'll tell you the story of one guy, um, his name was M.C. Grandy. He lived in Burlington. He was born in the Northeast Kingdom to a lumbering family. He came to Burlington to make his fortune when he was like 18 or 19. <coughs> he was a clerk, just a clerk. He worked for one of the big lumbering companies and when the bike craze happened around 1892, he opened a bike shop and he sold Columbia bicycles. And that was a consequential and very fateful thing for him. Because one thing that Pope denied his retailers was the ability to discount. He said, you can't have an end of year sale. You can't have an end of season sale. I want the value of my objects to be high. But other bike manufacturers would allow you to discount to get rid of that year's model. But Grandy went out of business. He couldn't sustain that because everyone he was competing with were make, giving discounts, even though Pope bicycles were very good bikes. So it was hard on a retailer at that level. And MC Grandy uh, was out of the business within three years. He eventually went on to become a bank clerk in Burlington and then a select board member. And so that, that flash in the pan, a lot of people took advantage of it. But uh, it wasn't a great business for a lot of them. And then they moved on. Again, I don't mean business related to bicycles. I mean the local grocer. The oh yeah, yeah. The drugs, sure. Did it have impact on the performance of business outside oh, you mean like the bicycle industry? Bike messengers yeah. and um, yeah, actually, bike messengers were a common sight in a lot of cities in the 1890s. New businesses to tra transport goods. Um, you, you had um, druggists selling things to cyclists. There were a lot of drugs being created at this time that were targeted to bicycle riders to bring them in, right? So yeah, no, everyone jumped on board in some shape or form. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with the development of the automobiles, if you take a look at the 1894 through about 1903, most everything, including the Duryea brothers on the Supreme field, uh, they used bicycle wheels. Yeah. But it was soon discovered that with the speed that you could generate, you couldn't turn without your wheels collapsing. Mm -hmm. Because the bicycle wheel could not sustain yeah. that type of lateral yeah. stress. Yeah. And so they had to build wooden wheels with wooden spike spokes, ultimately yeah. steel welded yeah. spokes that are about three or four times the diameter of a bicycle spoke. Yeah. And by the time you get into about 1906, you look at everybody's, they got these massive wheels that can handle that lateral motion, which is a serious thing when you turn. Yeah, right. And the bicycle wheels went out. Yeah. They no longer were used in modern yeah. times. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so some, some companies were creating uh, a variety of m mobility forms, including bicycles and four wheeled motorized vehicles and pedal vehicles and so on. Peugeot was one of those. And they quickly realized they needed to have different wheel types, yeah. depending on what the uses were going to be. Ford's first car yeah. is a, is a yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, well, thank you all very much. I'm happy to take more questions. And <laughs>